pretty good. All right, there we go. Welcome back. Wonderful to see you all coming back here. Wonderful meal we had this afternoon. Let's grab our hymnals and stand up. Hymn number 560, Just Over in the Glory Land. I have a home prepared where the saints abide just over in the glory land. And I long to be by my Savior's side just over in the glory land. Just over in the glory land I'll join the happy angel band. Just over in the glory land. Just over I am on my way to those mansions fair, just over in the glory land. There to sing God's praise and His glory share, just over in the glory land. Just over in the glory land, I'll join the happy angel band. Just over in the glory land, just over. the blood wash strong I will shout and sing just over in the glory land glad will send us to Christ the Lord and King just over in the glory land just over in the glory land I'll join the happy angel band just over in the glory land just over so much for being back this afternoon and giving me the opportunity to invest in you and that's exactly what I hope to do and want to do and we're going to finish this morning's message and I think that's very important. Let me remind you it's this Friday, this, this Friday that's coming up, the end of the week here, that we'll be having our first Friday family fellowship for fun, I think we're calling it. And I hope you'll come, and we'll be feeding you between 6 and 6.30. And, you know, the, we, we try to keep it simple, because if we didn't keep things simple, it'd be too much work for somebody, and we wouldn't be able to do it as often as we do it. By the way, we won't be doing it in December and January, because there's a lot going on. We'll kick it back up in February, so this will be the last one for a couple of months. But I hope you'll come this Friday, and we'll be feeding you between... 6 and 6.30, okay? You can come anytime between 6 and 6.30. And, uh, you know, we, we keep it light. We keep it simple. And, and the meals we try to keep simple. And, you know, they, to be honest, it's not, your, it's not a gourmet meal by any means. Uh, kind of novelty meals, anything from corn dogs to this one. Have I had this, what we're doing this Friday? Have I had it before? And tell the folks what we're having this Friday. Walking tacos. I, I, I sense a sense of excitement. Jackson, huh? Walking tacos, Jackson? What? what? I'll just wait. <laughs> See what? Jackson, do you know what a walking taco is? No. no. <laughs> but are you excited for it? I don't think you like tacos. But you were jumping up and down like you were excited. Like you were excited. <laughs> I better move on. We will be having walking tacos Friday. What, how many of you have no idea what that is? A good many. Well, come and see. We'll have it for And you say, well, I, you know, I, I can't eat. You know, it sounds like something I can't eat. Well, eat something else and come and visit and drink coffee and eat a dessert. We'll have a dessert. So uh, that'll be this Friday between 6 and 6.30. And uh, you know the routine. If you want to participate in games, you can. If you don't want to, you don't have to. 
Let's have a word of prayer. Remain standing. Brother Tim will come back and lead us in another song. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we ask your blessings now on this afternoon's service. Lord, this is a time that uh, we invest in your word, Lord, in part to inoculate us against our adversary, the devil. Lord, we, it's all around us what he can do and what he has done in destroying lives and hurting people. And Lord, I don't want that to happen in this congregation. And Lord, this will be time well spent this afternoon. So bless our time together this evening in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Remain standing, Brother Tim. All right. Hymn number 518. We'll sing all three verses. Oh, it is wonderful to be a Christian. Life has purpose now it never had before. There is meaning to each day and even more. For a joy and peace I can't explain is mine. Since I found new life in Christ my Lord divine. Oh, it is wonderful to be a Christian. Oh, it is wonderful to be God's child. Oh, it is wonderful to have your sins forgiven. Oh, it is wonderful to be redeemed, justified, forever reconciled. On the second, I can go directly to the Lord in prayer. He has told me I may boldly enter there. And he listens as his promises I plead. I find mercy there and grace for every need. Oh, it is wonderful to be a Christian. Oh, it is wonderful to be God's child. Oh, it is wonderful to have your sins forgiven. Oh, it is wonderful to be redeemed, justified, forever reconciled. I'm the last, and the hope of glory in heaven fills me so. Where I'll live for Christ forevermore, I know. This is why the things of earth I loosely hold. I've eternal riches better far than gold. Oh, it is wonderful to be a Christian. Oh, it is wonderful to be God's child. Oh, it is wonderful to have your sins forgiven. Oh, it is wonderful to be redeemed, justified, forever reconciled. Amen. Grace sing. You can be seated. I uh, appreciate... Uh, Scott and Velvet up there, I posed to them just this morning the possibility of showing uh, Matt's video that he showed to his church this morning, and I know that in the past we've had some problems with the video syncing up with the audio, and so they were up there testing it out, and sure enough, the audio is not, it's not off by much, but uh, off enough to be annoying. And, I, and we're, we have a guy that's coming uh, from downstate in a couple of weeks to hopefully to fix that and other issues that uh, we need help with. And, and uh, the, the sound system and video, it's, it's like a car. It, I mean, it, there's constant things going on. You, you know, you, you, never, you never resolve all the issues. It, it's just ongoing. There'll be something else in a few months and something else after that. That's just the nature of it up there. And, and I thought, well, we'll just postpone it. Then I thought, no, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and show it to you. And I hope it doesn't aggravate you too much that the audio and the visual are uh, not completely in sync. But to delay it past the day, it kind of loses its significance because this is a special day. Uh, for those of you visiting, I have two sons in the Well, I've got two sons and one daughter, and Aaron lives here. And my two sons are both pastors. One pastor is in um, uh, Dalhart, Texas, up in the Panhandle of Texas, and my other son, the youngest son, Matt, uh, pastors in Lodi, Wisconsin, which is outside of uh, <clears throat> Madison, Wisconsin, and uh, both those boys pretty much grew up in this church. Sharon, do you recall what age they were when we got here, or what grade they were in when we got here? You remember? Aaron, you remember? Matt would have probably been in the fifth. Okay, in the fifth. So uh, a lot of you, you know, they, they consider Mayo home and Mayo Baptist Church their home church. And, um, you know, they grew up here. Some of you saw them grow up here. 
and I'm very proud of, of both my sons. Uh, Matt has had a, a difficult go of it. Uh, he was called by a church in Lodi uh, four or five years ago to come be their pastor, a small little fledgling church, and he went there, and uh, that did not go well. And it did not go well at all. So he found himself having moved to Lodi, now with no church to pastor, uh, but some people in the area came to him and said, we, we need to start a church. And uh, starting a church is one of the most difficult things you can ever do in your life. I have heard other preachers who started churches give their testimony about the, the challenges the setbacks and the, and the disappointments along the way. And to be honest with you, I thought numerous times that it's, Matt's not going to make it. That church isn't going to make it. Because they would do well for a while, then people would leave, and people you thought were going to be there weren't going to be there. And, and most of the times you're building with new people, so you don't have a core group of, uh, of uh, experienced Christians or mature Christians is what I'm looking for. You, you, it's just lacking, and it can be very frustrating, and more than that, heartbreaking. So to be honest, I had a lot of conversations with Matt along the way. And uh, just recently, they had the opportunity for the first time to purchase and own their own church. And it was previously a Lutheran church, and then a Mexican congregation bought it, and they got it from the Mexican congregation. And it far exceeds anything that they've ever had before. They have rented rooms, they've rented a small building and what have you, and they feel like they have gone to heaven because it's a full-fledged church with a commercial kitchen and a fellowship hall and lots of Sunday school spaces and offices and, and an auditorium. And uh, they got it for a very, very... In fact, I told Matt, I said, you must be say. I said, Matt, what do they want for that building? Because he showed me pictures and even some video. And he said, they want $350,000. I said, no, nah, that can't be right. I, I, I said, if they tried to buy that property and build that building today, I said, I would guess at a minimum $2 million. He said, oh, we've been told that's what we're going to have to insure it for. He said, but they want $350,000. And here they are, a fledgling long, young church, and they had to uh, raise first... Uh, $100,000 to put down on, on that. And I was amazed at how fast that money came in and, and where it came from. And he's still expecting, they, they raised more than enough, and then there's another big church over in Madison that has uh, committed to give them yet another $25,000, which is important, Bob, because he, he's learning the heater just broke down <laughs> in the new building. So, and Matt knew, he said, I'm just exchanging one set of problems for a new set of problems. But anyway, to, they've only been in the building for a few weeks, and today is their kind of open house. And he was hoping for a good group of people there this morning, and I haven't talked to him, I don't know. But he made this video to kind of share his story. And this is really for those of you that know Matt and have known him and seen him. I, I want you to hear his story. The, the words are going to be a little bit out of sync, and I know that's, that's aggravating to me, but... That's just the way it is until we hopefully get it fixed in a couple weeks. So this is the video. It's kind of a video of their history. And uh, we're blessed. Out of this church, we, you know, Matt is pastoring. My, my other son, Jeremy, is pastoring. Uh, Brother Tim Boonstra is with his son, Tom, who is pastoring in California. He's out of this church. And then our three previous assistant pastors uh, are all pastoring uh, around Michigan, Missouri, and Wyoming, uh, Rumley's, uh, what's her for, Tamara, yeah, Tamara's out of this church, she's uh, married, uh, full-time ministry, uh, and uh, Clarence, you know, was short-lived here a few summers, and he's, last I heard, he was in ministry in Oklahoma, and I consider that a great blessing to have had these people either grow up in our church or spend some time here and uh, I just, I pray for them all the time. So uh, this is about a 10-minute video. It's Matt's story, and I, I want it to be a blessing to you, okay? So uh, just deal with the out-of-sync stuff. So Velvet, if you're ready.
in the winter of 2017, God made it clear that the ministry I was serving in um, was just not where we were going to be long term. And uh, it kind of happened suddenly and we were a little bit kind of lost. Like, what does that mean for our family? What does it mean for our ministry, for our future? And so while we were a little frustrated and concerned about what it all meant, we just started to look to the Lord and say, okay, God, what, what's your next step? What's your next plan for us? I assumed it would mean moving somewhere else, hopefully somewhere warmer, but that proved to not be the case. Um, but God has uh, a sense of humor and he basically started to put on the hearts of people here in this community that, hey, Matt, we want you to be our pastor and we wanna help you start something, which was hilarious because I've had people ask me if I'd ever be interested in starting a church and my answer was always a laughable no. Um, there's no way that that's, that's way too complicated, way too much involved in that. There's no way I'd ever wanna do that. And I feel like maybe God was laughing back at me saying, ha ha, but that's what I want you to do. And it has proven to be the hardest but greatest thing we've ever done is, is launching a church. So that being said, after prayer and discussing it with a few others outside this church, we believe that God is calling us to name this new body of believers Grace Valley Church. My prayer is that when others hear this name, it will help them to realize that this church is a place where they can experience and know grace. Grace from those of us that call it our church home, as well as learn of the grace granted to them by Jesus Christ. In January of 2018, um, Christy and I agreed to meet with people, to host Sunday services, but we weren't calling it a church. We weren't taking up offerings. We, we weren't doing any of those kinds of things. I was just gathering, we were singing together and, and I would preach. And I said to, to the people there, I said, hey, let's, let's do this and we'll see what happens. All the while kind of thinking, it seems crazy to me that God would call me to plant a church here in, in Lodi. As we continued to meet and have those services together, uh, God just more and more started working on our hearts that this is exactly what he wanted for us to do. And it, it was a little, it, a little, it was terrifying in so many ways because I didn't know how to start a church. I didn't know how to set up a 501c3. I didn't know how to um, get bank accounts for a, a corporation or, or any of that kind of stuff. So it was all brand new. And God brought along amazingly, uh, but not surprisingly, the right people at the right time to help us kind of get the ball rolling on some of those things, other churches that helped out, advisors that helped get the ball rolling for us. And so it was neat to see how God was taking care of things. Initially, we were meeting in the, uh, in the town hall building out on County Road V, uh, which even that was just miraculous that here we went, you know, people saying, hey, let's, let's have a church. Well, we don't have a place to meet and God provided a place to meet. Well, we don't have a budget, but you can use it for free. Um, and so little things like that just began to really open our eyes to the fact that maybe God was, was in this. But that building wasn't going to last long term because there wasn't enough space for us to have our services and to have kids ministry. And so we began looking around and, uh, and Reach Out Lodi made their building available to us for just such a great price. They, they really were helping us out uh, with that. And so we began to rent that building and throughout this whole time period. Uh, for various reasons, we had to meet at various different locations. Some part of it was COVID. Sometimes when we were at the town hall, we would have um, they would have voting, and so we wouldn't be able to meet in there. So we've met in the upstairs of of the Associated Bank. We've met at the old O'Key School. We met in our backyard. Um, we've just kind of been everywhere. And, and what God did in all of that is He helped remind me that the church is not the building. The church is the people, and God has been building his church here through the people. And that's been exciting because we've had times where the building was far less than ideal, uh, but the church continued to grow and blossom because God was at work in, in that process. Eventually, um, God brought across our path the, the place that was formerly KMA Bodilly Building. That was a building that Christy brought to my attention when she told me that it was, uh, she knew the owner and it was about to be vacant. And she said, I think we should talk to him. And I thought, there's no way that the owner of that building, because it was offices, I was like, there's no way he's gonna let us uh, gut that and turn it into a church auditorium. And uh, we got the opportunity to meet with Steve Brokish, who is one of the kindest human beings you, you would ever know. And 
Unfortunately for us, God's already called him home uh, not too long ago. But Steve uh, worked so graciously with us and got excited about our vision. And he said, within reason, you can do whatever you want with the building. So this is kind of the building without anything in it. They've taken out a lot of their stuff. So this is going to get taken out later. And obviously this is going to get removed. Eventually the wall here is going to go. Um, the wall Christie is holding up right now is going to go. Bum, 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 bum. I would get up and show you around, but I'm tired. I'm sitting here. So we're sitting basically where I preach from, and that is the wall gone. So we did. We gutted it. We put in new lights and carpet and ordered some chairs, and, and we turned it into a church, and it was beautiful. And we thought it would take us years, three, four, five years before it would ever fill up. And it didn't take long before we were packed shoulder to shoulder in there and just running out of room. While we were meeting at that blue building across from the BP, really small, um, God continued to bless our church, continued to grow until we really couldn't grow anymore. I mean, we just plateaued because of our, because of our space issues. And we began to pray about what God would have us to do. And we prayed about getting land and building a building, but getting land around here is really difficult and very expensive. And building a building was gonna be outrageous if, if you could even make it happen. Um, and, and so we started considering, you know, do we, do we talk to the school system about renting? Do we, uh, there's no movie theaters. There's, no, there's nothing like that around here that's large enough for us to be able to, to rent a space. And so this church was up here and I knew that they were meeting at another location on Sunday mornings. And so I came in and I met the pastor, his name is Giovanni. And I, I talked to him and I said, hey, I don't know what your guys' plans are, but is there any way you would rent to us for a couple hours a week? And for the, in the moment, that just wasn't the right fit for their church and they weren't ready to rent it out. Um, but Giovanni told me that at some point they were interested in selling the building. But it wasn't, that wasn't the right time for them or for us. So fast forward a little ways, um, just several months later, I'm sitting in Costco eating pizza because that's what healthy people do. And I'm sitting in Costco with my family and Christy and I were talking about our space, space issues. And I said, I wonder if I should contact Giovanni again and just ask him when he is planning on selling. And she's like, yeah, it wouldn't hurt to ask. So literally while I'm sitting there in Costco, I send him a text. I said, um, hey, what's your time frame? When, when are you looking to sell? Later this year, next year? And he responds um, with something to the effect of make me an offer, which blew me away because I wasn't ready to make an offer. And I, I didn't know enough about the real estate. I didn't know enough about the parcels. I, I just didn't know. And so I began talking with uh, Pastor Mike Beresford, who's executive pastor at, um, at High Point Church. And I was talking to other realtors and really just kind of beginning to explore um, what, it would, what it would take to even make an offer on a building like this and doing some research on the finances of it. And so over time, we came up with an offer that we presented. And at the time, initially, it wasn't, it wasn't what, they were, what they were looking for. They were really hoping to get, obviously, they were hoping to get more for it. And we understood that, but it just wasn't going to work for us. And so we talked about it and said, hey, that's it's just not going to be feasible. And then over time, they began to come down a little bit. And we were just like, we just felt like we weren't trying to be unfair, but we just felt like this is, this is what we can do. This is what's affordable for us. And in time, um, I came back and said, Giovanni, why don't you rent to us for a year and let us try to grow and raise some finances to, to make this happen. And he said, no, he's like, we're not interested in renting. He said, but I tell you what, he's like, I've been praying about it and I really feel like God wants you guys to get this building and so we're gonna accept your offer. It was a miracle. Um, I, I thought there was no way in the world we were gonna get it for that price. I thought we'd have to counter somewhere along the way, but God knew what he was doing and provided the building. And so we're here in this place today, not because of anything that, that we have done, we're here in this building because God is great and because his works are mighty and because he can do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. And so we praise God for the space. We pray that this space would be used to bring him honor and glory. Our mission around here is to know and make known Jesus. And our desire is that this place would be a place where every Sunday and throughout the week, it'll be a place where we can help people know and make known Jesus and it'll be a light in this dark world. It'll be a service to this community. And God willing, this will be a place where people find grace in the valley. And so that's our desire through this church, Grace Valley Church here at 206 Pleasant Street.
No, neither Jeremy nor Matt do everything like their dad does, but they do it where it matters. They are, if I can brag, they're excellent preachers, and they preach the word, and they proclaim the gospel, and I am very proud of them for that. So some of y'all saw him here. Brother Bud, you employed that young man for a while, and you were, he's given testimony, you were rough on him a couple of times, and he thanked you for it. He did, Matt thanked you. He said, that was all part of my growing up process, and helped Dale a couple of times here and, here and there with, with various projects. I mean, he and Matt would say they built your log home. I mean, he and Jeremy claimed to have actually built it. That's a little bit of a stretch, but, you know. Uh, so you folks have been good to us and our family, and I know that y'all are uh, equally proud. Uh, Matt's been doing a lot of study lately on current events kind of stuff that I've been doing, and Matt's smart. I mean, I, I know I'm his dad. I know it sounds like I'm bragging. I guess I am. But he, he gets it, and he, he picks up on stuff, and he's, he's an excellent preacher. Both, both my boys are. And uh, somebody come to our house when we're all there and says, I'm here to see Pastor McMorris. or somebody will have to say, which one? You know, <laughs> there are three there. And look, whether your children are called to pastor or not, Sharon and I are blessed. Not, not because we are, uh, because I'm a pastor, okay? Some people might think, well, yeah, you're a pastor, and, you know, of course your kids have turned out right. Folks, I know lots of pastors whose kids have turned out horrible. So, it, no, it, it's not that. It, it's understanding the principles of, of child rearing and, and, and taking your faith seriously and trying your best as parents not to please the world or please anybody else, but trying your best as parents to raise them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And I would receive great joy in seeing your kids blessed. Like I say, whether they go into ministry or, or not, that's neither here nor there. But for them to grow up to love and respect their mom and dad and to be faithful in a good church, that's what we're striving for. Now, quickly... Uh, let's, let's finish this morning's message. This morning's message, uh, Peter is wrapping up his instructions to first century Christians, first generation Christians, who rather than being praised for following the Lord, they're being criticized and ostracized for following the Lord. And he doesn't want them to be silent. He doesn't want them to retreat. He, he's giving them instructions on how to handle the criticism. And as he gets to the end of the letter, chapter 5, he really gets to the heart of the matter, that behind all of the criticism actually is Satan. And he says, for that reason, to be able to handle it right, you've got to be, as we said this morning, sober, and, and you've got to be vigilant. And he says that because they needed to hear it. And it was recorded because we need to hear it. And then to finish up that message this morning, after he tells them to be sober and to be vigilant, he tells them why. He gives them a warning. This warning is as much for you as it was for those moms and dads, those senior saints back 2,000 years ago or teenagers. It's just as relevant. Uh, so he tells them, be sober, be vigilant, and he tells them why. Let's look. We'll finish this up. Number one, he says, you must be sober and vigilant because, because you have an adversary. There, there's somebody out to get you. There is somebody stalking you, trying to do you harm. Look at verse number eight again. He says, be sober, be vigilant, because... Not just for something to do, not because it's cool, not because I'm telling you to, because your adversary, the devil. And as one writer said, this is the reason why we should be sober and vigilant. 
we have an ever-active, implacable, subtle enemy to contend with. There is an adversary after you. There's an adversary after your spouse. There's an adversary after your children. There's an adversary after people you love, family or, or, or your church family. And we see that all too often he is successful. People that are on the outskirts of society or families that are so dysfunctional or a culture that is so decadent are the results of this adversary. Someone that is pursuing me. Someone that is pursuing Sharon and Aaron and everybody in this room. So he says, be sober, be vigilant, because you have an adversary, the devil. And there are certain characteristics that the devil possesses as an adversary that, that we need to be aware of. And just think about it for a second. An adversary is going to be cunning and deceptive. More about that next Sunday morning. That's his main tool. To get you and others to believe lies. So this adversary, we've got to be on our toes. We've got to be sober. We've got to be vigilant because he is going to be cunning and deceptive. My son Jeremy that lives uh, in Dalhart, Texas, he loves to hunt. He, he, he is, a, I guess that got in his blood while he was here in Michigan, and he's carried it with him. And even out on the plains of northwest Texas, where they're in a tree within 100 miles, he's learned how to hunt up there. But to conquer the foe, he has learned to be cunning and deceptive. And that's how he got this monster elk with a bow the other day. And uh, I'd be proud to show you the picture. Uh, and uh, he, he did it because, I mean, it, it's just open prairie. So, and to, to get a, 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 not an elk, did I say elk? It's a, a mule deer. To get this mule deer, you got to be cunning. You got to be deceptive. So they put a tank of water out there. They put some food out there. And he got a couple, some old uh, crate, not crate, pallets. Yeah, he got a bunch of pallets and piled them up and he hid behind the pallets. And it wasn't real water. It wasn't real food that was there. He had to plant that there to deceive this mule deer, which was a nice one, and, and he got him. And that, 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 that mule deer, you know, came to the end of his life because he, I guess he wasn't sober. He wasn't vigilant. And so it is with us. Satan, is, it, he'll, he'll be cunning. He'll, he'll be deceptive. He will, t he will tell you lies. You don't need to be in church. You don't need to read your Bible. An adversary is going to be cunning and deceptive. An adversary, adversary is going to be relentless and undeterred. I don't know how often Jeremy had to go out there and wait, but he was unrelenting. He was undeterred till he conquered that deer. And an adversary is going to be filled with, I wouldn't say this is true of Jeremy, but of the devil it would be, of, with animosity and hostility. Thus, he's an adversary. So, that's what you're dealing with. Peter says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, he's out to get me. He's out to get Sharon. He's out to get... Aaron, he's out to get you, your children, your loved ones. It, it makes sense knowing the, the, the seriousness of the threat that we be sober, that we be vigilant. Then he says, number two, number one, because your adversary the devil, and then number two, you must be sober and vigilant because your adversary is intimidating and unrelenting. We're, we're dealing with a real threat that is intimidating and unrelenting. 
Be sober, look at verse number 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about. I mean, Peter is painting a very clear picture here. You know, just what I'm doing up here. I mean, I wouldn't want to walk up on him out in the middle of nowhere with no fence between me and him. I mean, that he is intimidating and unrelenting. A roaring lion, one writer said, He's a roaring lion, hungry, fierce, strong, and cruel. The fierce and greedy pursuer of souls. And and that that lion will go after an alligator? Or that lion will go after a baby lamb? And our adversary will go after you or will go after your dear precious child? And he says, he walketh about. Another writer says, to this end, he is unwearied and restless in his malicious endeavors, for he always, night and day, goes about studying and contriving whom he may ensnare to their eternal ruin. So a roaring lion walking about, that describes an adversary that threatens, that frightens, and that intimidates. He's not afraid of you. He's not afraid of me. And he is prowling all the time to bring me down, to bring Sharon down, to bring Aaron down, Jeremy down, Matthew down. Are you down? And then he says, he's given the reasons. Now he's implored us. If it was me, I'd say, please be sober. Please be vigilant. Yes, have your good times, have your Christmas parties, have your Thanksgiving meals, celebrate birthdays. There is a time for that. But keep your eyes open. Keep your ears open. And not only can you do both, you must do both. And then he brings us to point number three. He's explaining why you have to be sober, why you have to be vigilant. So number three, the third reason, you must be sober and vigilant because your adversary is intent on destroying your faith and testimony. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He wants to put an end to your faith, an end to your testimony. One writer says devour means to cause the complete and sudden destruction of someone or something. Our enemy is seeking to bring us to spiritual ruin. To demoralize us so that we are on the sidelines, so to speak. To weaken our faith and replace it with fear. And I can sadly think of sad testimonies through the years of people that were not sober, they were not vigilant, they started playing with the lion... He's cunning and deceiving. Come and play. This is fun. This isn't as bad as what the preacher said. And they are no longer to be found in God's church. He says he wants to devour your testimony, your ability to serve, or your walk with God. And oftentimes, he will use unsaved people to accomplish this task. The the people that will criticize you because you know that the Bible says that homosexuality is a sin or transgenderism is a sin. Uh, All this drag queen stuff is, is, is an abomination. Those become... The Lord says, and I'll I'll share it with you next Sunday, you're of your father, the devil, who's the father of lies. I mean, you're, you're doing his work. They're doing his work. So, you have to be sober and vigilant because you have an adversary. We're called to be sober and vigilant because your adversary is intimidating and unrelenting. You have to be sober and vigilant because your adversary is intent on destroying your faith and testimony. So, as we close, Peter says, be sober. Be vigilant. 
Does that mean I have to cower? I have to be scared? I can't go anywhere? I can't do anything? No, the Lord brings us joy. He wants us to know the joy of the Lord. He says, I've come to give you life and give it more abundantly. But you and I would make a mistake if that's all we think about and we focus on that. But at the same time, we're not keeping our eyes and ears open and being vigilant and being sober. We can do both. We must do both. So how do you be sober? I think one way, and these are just practical applications that I as your pastor would encourage you to do. Always have your emotions under, under control. People that are always silly, people that are always giddy, I mean always, are people that I think are vulnerable because their, their, their emotions are controlling them. Or maybe they're at the other extreme, always sad, always depressed, always forlorn. I, I think those emotions become a distraction, can leave them vulnerable. Number two, make sure you are not under some other control. You have to be careful of drugs, alcohol, anything that might come in possession of you that would curtail your ability to be sober, to be vigilant. And I would also say, put yourself in the place where you can have access to a godly mentor. And I would add to that, not only have a godly mentor, a good Christian friend that's mature in the Lord, but put yourself where your senses are going to be sharpened. That's what we're doing. We're sharpening your senses. I mean, you're going to be better equipped to handle the, de the devil this week than, than people that aren't here. So you're, you're doing the right thing. So that's how you're, you're sober. And then lastly, how to be vigilant. You have to always be attentive to your circumstances. You, you always have to be on guard. You, you, you can never be ill-informed or naive. Number two, you must always be sensitive to potential threats. To be sensitive to potential threats. Uh, this morning I showed in our Sunday school class a video to the young couples. Uh, this woman's talking about uh, the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the, gro the, growth, what, the growth of transgenderism, Sharon, help me, the explosion. I mean, there, there's, there's more and more teenagers today that are buying into transgenderism. And uh, at the end of the video, the lady was giving some practical suggestions like this. And, and she said to, to guard your kids against that influence, it says monitor and limit the influence of social media. You know, so be sensitive to the potential threats. And number three, you must take steps to recognize unwise circumstances and potential threats. You need to be proactive. You, you need to do your homework. You need to know where your spouse is, what your spouse is doing. You need to know that you're accountable to each other. You need to know, particularly with your, with your children, who are they associating with? What are they being taught at school? Who are they hanging around with? What kind of influences even are the neighbor kids having on them when they go over to their house? What kind of influences are they coming under? I mean, after all, it does say, be sober. Be vigilant. Cannot be naive. Cannot be gullible. And for sure, we cannot be lazy. Let's stand, please, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Would you pray this afternoon as we close? My encouragement to you is simply pray and ask God to help you to do whatever is necessary to be both sober and vigilant. We don't want you to be a sad story. We don't want you to be a sad testimony. We want you to be a bright light for the cause of Christ. And I believe if we as a church collectively 
are both sober and vigilant, we're in for God's blessings. And individually, the same. To be sober and vigilant means you are in for God's blessings. So would you ask God to help you to take whatever necessary steps are available to make sure that you are both sober and vigilant. Jade's going to begin to play, and the invitation is open for you. Thank you, and you can look this way. To the best of my ability, I've tried to faithfully convey to you the truths of 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 8. Because it's that verse, not this preacher, it's that verse in your heart that will be a help and a blessing to you, your family, and others. And to the best of my ability, humanly speaking, we've tried to convey the truths of that verse to you and for you to take it and run with it uh, will be of enormous benefit to you. It will be enormous benefit to the cause of Christ, and it will be uh, honor and glory to the Lord. Now, the devil's going to fight us, and you may slip up every now and then, and if you fall off the horse, just get, dust yourself off and get back, get back on him again, because uh, it's going to happen. But commit yourself to being sober and being vigilant. We don't want you to be a horrible statistic. Uh, don't forget this Friday, we'll be having our first fa Friday Family Fellowship. And everybody's invited. That's, that's visitors. You don't have to be a church member for that. Uh, you come and be a part of that. And then be in your place this Wednesday. Uh, we'll be studying it back in the book of Habakkuk. What a great Old Testament book that is. And uh, pray for Sharon and I. We're going over to camp. You know, we are big fans of Camp Kobiak. We support Camp Kobiak. And uh, it benefits the teenagers, the kids, and pretty much everybody. And it benefits us preachers because they're having a special meeting tomorrow night and Tuesday morning for preachers. And so uh, hopefully I go and get my toes stepped on. And I get challenged and uh, hopefully encouraged as well. So we'll be going over there. It'll be just tomorrow afternoon and half a day on Tuesday. So we will be back in our place this Wednesday. If you can help on November the 12th, with putting up uh, some of the Christmas decorations outside, be sure and let Brother Dustin know. Any other announcements need to be made this evening or this afternoon before we go? Anybody? Choir practice? Yes, choir. Choir's doing a great job. Tim's doing a great job, and uh, Jade's doing a great a job now accompanying the choir. It's just beautiful, just beautiful music, and we are so blessed. So, with that being said... Turn around and find somebody real good looking near you and acknowledge their good lookingness. You are dismissed. <laughs>